On April 26, 1986, there was one of the worst accidents in the history of nuclear power, which contributed greatly to the collapse of the USSR. It is not a coincidence that many authors of films and science fiction books link the accident's departure with the reason for the preservation of the USSR. It is unprovable, but the accident itself still arouses a lot of interest. In one of my previous videos, I started telling about how the work on the sarcophagus construction took place. In this video, I want to continue my story. Alas, there is a tragic episode connected with the construction of the sarcophagus, or rather with its completion. On October 2nd at 1730, one of the Miates, flying over the shelter in the rally to celebrate the completion of one of its walls in order to disperse the decontamination solution, caught the tail rotor of one of the cranes. In front of the liquidator's eyes, the machine collapsed right next to the turbine hall. There were four people on board, Captain Vladimir Vorobyov, Commander, Petty Officers Alexander Yunkind and Leonid Kristik, Navigator and Flight Engineer respectively, and Senior Warrant Officer Nikolai Gansuk, according to one version he was on board at the request of nuclear specialists, according to another one he decided to hitch a ride to the operational airfield. All of them perished. It is doubly tragic that Vorobyov returned from Afghanistan, where he made 646 combat sorties with 417 flight hours, was shot down and was the only survivor of the whole crew, though badly injured, after which he managed to restore his flying skills. In December 2017, a large piece of the tail of the car was found on the roof of the mashroom. The moment the helicopter crashed. Bio-robots. Decontamination. The word had many meanings in those months. Washing houses and roads with special solutions. Digging up soil and replacing it with clean sand. A simple showering according to special rules, first one rinsed with cold water and washed off the dust and dirt, cold water would close the pores and radioactive dust would not get there, then one rinsed with hot water and soap, washed off the pores whatever got there during the work, then one rinsed with cold water again, pores closed and received no new radioactive dust when leaving the bath. The work is super dirty, and before the reactor is closed by the sarcophagus, it is also ungrateful. The reactor sneezes, cesium sits on the just washed surfaces. You have to decontaminate again, comrades. In short, there are many aspects. Intelligence Radiation reconnaissance is a broad concept. It was conducted by a variety of methods, but all these methods boiled down to the same thing, to measure radiation levels at different points along the route. The dosimetrist is in charge of it, since he is in charge of the device for measuring the background at a given point. At Chernobyl in the first months, reconnaissance was constantly going on and was constantly bumping into high fields, but it was vitally important. Why? Because it was necessary to find fuel, it was necessary to find out the condition of the block structures, it was necessary to find clean rooms to organize work there, dirty rooms to decontaminate and further organize work there, super dirty rooms that needed to be isolated. In short, a lot of work, and it was carried out after the completion of the sarcophagus, and at a more intense pace, which is generally unusual. More on that later. Inside the emergency power unit. Inside the turbine hall. If people walked inside, they rode outside on equipment whose armor gave a noticeable attenuation of the external radiation. And then, a reconnaissance where reserve fighters are XBZ troops, they have such equipment, usually armored truck BRDM-2RH under the states. Reconnaissance routes often overlapped with each other, overlapping almost all important areas of the exclusion zone, and went deeply beyond this circle with a radius of 30 kilometers. This was because it was necessary to find out what was going on within the emission traces, one of which went, for example, to Belarus, forcing the eviction of villages located far outside the circle of 60 kilometers in diameter. Villages were evicted at an average background at the measuring points, usually four suburbs, according to the number of sides of the world, and the center, of 0.7 millerengen slash hour. And many settlements had a much higher level of pollution, for example, the aforementioned Kovshilovka. It was necessary to monitor these and other settlements that were hit by the trace, but there were not sufficient levels to resettle them. This includes a number of towns and villages in Belarus, in fact, a fifth of the country was contaminated. Gomel and Magalev regions took the main blow. The northern Ukraine was also seriously polluted, 
at one time there was a risk that even Kiev would be evicted. Even Russia, 148 kilometers from the epicenter, was affected, but compared to Ukraine and Belarus, the border of which is in general 7 kilometers in a straight line, the Bryansk and Tula regions got off lightly. So all these vast areas have fallen under the scrutiny of the scouts. Approximate scheme of the Ukrainian part of the exclusion zone and the zone of unconditional, compulsory, resettlement from the wiki. Gray line separating the zone railroad Chernigov of Ruch, respectively, a healthy blue bean next to it, CHNPP cooling pond, nuclear power plant is 8 kilometers from the border, below right, Kiev reservoir. Map of cesium-137 contamination in 1996, again for understanding the scale. Depending on the levels received on average along the route, the scouts were given doses. Nevertheless, it was often possible even several months after the accident to come across very, very high doses where there should be none. At the same time, the intelligence had its own measures, different from the staff map, on which there were three subzones within the 30-kilometer zone, 15 millirentgen hour and above, 5 millirentgen hour and above and 1.5 millirentgen hour and above. And very many things then learned by experience. Sergei Murny, scout, in the summer of 1986 in his memoirs says that he and his fighters at the level of one Rankin per hour began to feel what they considered the weakness of their bodies. There was also such a thing as adaptation to radiation. According to Murny, the newcomers were first put to camp work for a couple of days so that they would get used to it, otherwise there was a risk of consequences, as Murny himself had encountered. A phenomenon that has probably never been observed in previous accidents remains completely unexplored. We are talking about a strange irritation of the upper respiratory tract, the gastrointestinal tract in people who were in the area relatively close to the emergency station. There almost everyone had cough, runny nose, many had liquid stools without any signs of infection. The temperature remained normal. Since all these phenomena were observed in the first days of arrival of a new person to the zone, the assumption of damage due to external irradiation was immediately rejected. However, even then, the role of local radiation exposure from numerous short-lived alpha and beta emitters that were in a gaseous state was not completely ruled out. At that time, the toxic hypothesis seemed the most acceptable, it was assumed that a variety of other compounds, not necessarily of radioactive nature, were escaping from the reactor crater along with radioactive substances. Many residents said they could feel a metallic taste in their mouths. Then, very quickly, these phenomena of irritation of the upper respiratory tract and gastrointestinal tract ceased and the issue closed itself. Today it is no longer easy to dismiss the version of radioactive contamination of the respiratory tract and gastrointestinal mucosa by alpha emitters, soft gamma and beta emitters during the first days of the accident. Maybe the then non-radioactive interpretation was wrong. The aviators were also doing reconnaissance. For this purpose, they had special helicopters, Mi-24RH, which had special equipment on board which enabled them to take soil samples. In addition to military helicopters, civilian Mi-2 and Ka-26 operated in the area, which were also used to collect soil samples. In addition, radio reconnaissance involved specially converted aircraft IL-14, which flew all over the area attack at an altitude of 100 meters. These machines were used by specialists of the All-Russian Research Institute of Agricultural Meteorology. I will tell you about how the decontamination was done and what equipment was used for it in one of the next parts of the video. Subscribe to the channel and share this video with your friends. Give it a thumbs up. Write in the comments about what else interesting you can tell about this video. See you in the new video.